Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent, Christmas Eve morning. Please know how very welcome you are. You are welcome here without reservation. Today during in-person worship, we're going to, if you were here with us in in-person worship, we would light the final purple candle for love. And then tonight, if you are here in person, we will light the center candle, the white Christ candle, to represent his coming into the world and the holy light that he brings. It is always my prayer that you will know the presence of Christ with us and that you would find inspiration, comfort, and challenge for the living of these days. On this Christmas Eve morning, there are two scriptures before us. One comes from Psalm 126. It's entitled, A Harvest of Joy. When our Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. And then our, our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negeb. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. And now, from the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, it is commonly called Mary's Song of Praise. And Mary said, 
my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servants. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. May God add understanding and a sense of joy in the proclamation of these words. Amen. My sermon title this morning is Harvesting Joy. What gives you joy? A friend of mine, a widower who is dating in his 60s, asks this of his dates. I think that is a great question because the answer reveals a lot about a person's priorities and passions. What gives you joy is an open-ended question that sparks a depth of conversation and would help one get to know someone at a very deep level and potentially measure compatibility. Some people make a distinction between happiness and joy. Happiness, they assert, is temporary. You know, getting an ice cream cone and buying a new toy make you happy. Joy, conversely, may be learning that you are going to become a grandparent for the first time, or the feeling you get when holding a newborn baby. I'm not one to split hairs because things that make me joyful also make me happy, but I also sense that joy is a deeper feeling and a deeper knowing or contentment based on faith. I can have joy, for example, even in sadness and grieving because my faith tells me that all will truly be well one day, if not in this life, then in the life to come. That kind of joy reminds me of a story about John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, when he was crossing the Atlantic to come to America from England. His fellow travelers were English and German Moravians, a religious group whose strong faith really impressed and influenced him. On the voyage, he had observed their seriousness of behavior and their humility. He witnessed them freely serving the other passengers, doing things without complaining, things he said the English would not undertake. And at one point when the sea broke over the ship and split the main sail in pieces and covered the ship and poured in between the decks, a terrible screaming began among the English. The Moravians calmly sang a psalm and carried on with their worship service that had begun before the incident. Afterwards, John Wesley asked them, were you not afraid? A Moravian answered, I thank God, no. Wesley pressed on, were not your women and children afraid? The man replied mildly, no, our women and children are not afraid to die. Wesley went on to remark about the difference between the crying and trembling English and the God-fearing Moravians. He concluded the story by saying, at 12, the wind fell. This was the most glorious day which I have hitherto seen. I imagine the great faith and abiding joy the Moravians must have had in their hearts to face peril so calmly and with such certainty that God was with them in both life and death. Our scriptures today contain expressions of joy because this is, um, well, last week was, was Joy Sunday, the, the third Sunday of Advent, the day that we lit the pink candle for joy. And today, of course, we lit the final candle for love. But all of these, this hope, peace, joy, love, it's all related. But I want to take a deep dive into our passages today that are in reality expressions of joy. 
The first one is a psalm, a song of ascents entitled A Harvest of Joy. There are 15 songs of ascents in our Psalter. They were psalms sung by the Israelites as they processed to worship at the temple or ascended the road to Jerusalem to attend the three pilgrim festivals, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Psalm 126, our psalm today, is a community song of trust or confidence that proclaims God as the one who brings joy out of sorrow, laughter out of tears, and good out of evil. For me, it is, it, it's a psalm or song echoing the theme of resurrection, the greatest joy of all. The psalmist prays, may those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. We get an image of sadness and emptiness turning to great joy and fullness at the end of the psalm. And this is a the theme of resurrection, something that can give us great joy. Mary's song of praise and joy, also known as the Magnificat, is that portion of gospel reading we had from Luke today. Similar to Psalm 126, she talks about the hungry being filled with great things, much as resurrection is. Um, Mary's song is an inversion of the, the usual order of things. In her song, the rich are sent away empty. She sings of the joy of the natural and unjust order of the world being inverted. I imagine that Mary uttered her Magnificat ecstatically. She was in her cousin Elizabeth's presence, and, and Mary already knew that she was chosen to bear the Messiah. This song is called the Magnificat because she is magnifying the Lord with joyful praise, much as the pilgrims in our psalm today um, sang on their, their song of, as their song of ascent on their way to Jerusalem. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Often this hymn, the first in the New Testament, is sung in churches on Christmas Eve. You should take a deep look at it sometime and see how truly revolutionary it is. Verses 52 and 53 say, God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. The Magnificat has been called the most revolutionary document in the world because it reverses the world's values and turns them upside down. Let me tell you what some theologians have made of it throughout modern history. E. Stanley Jones, a famous preacher of two generations ago, was the first to call the Magnificat the most revolutionary document in the world. Gelden Hayes, a Dutch theologian, said that the Magnificat announces powerful revolutionary principles. Murrow, another theologian, talks about the revolutionary germ found in the Magnificat. Barclay, an English theologian, says that the Magnificat is a bombshell and has revolutionary terror. It takes the standards of the world and turns them upside down. William Barclay teaches that in the Magnificat there are three revolutions, an economic revolution, a political revolution, and a moral revolution. Still another theologian says that the Magnificat terrified the Russian czars. Martin Luther said that the Magnificat comforts the lowly and terrifies the rich. Gilmore, another theologian, said that the Magnificat fosters revolutionaries in our churches. He said that the church needs the leaven of discontent and the Magnificat makes the church restive against poverty and wretchedness. I know we're so apt to think of Mary as young and sweet and mild and virginal and trusting, but what we don't realize is, is that she's God's revolutionary. One article I read referred to Mary as a punk rocker in her role as a revolutionary. She and her cousin Elizabeth, who was carrying John the Baptist at the same time, are the pregnant embodiments of the revolution, the change in order and the change in era that is now coming upon the earth. The, old woman, the one woman is old, Elizabeth, and her son, John the Baptist, will end an old era by preparing the way for the new. 
And the other woman, Mary, is, is young and a virgin, and her son Jesus will usher in the new era. And right here in this passage, we are moving from the old covenant and law to the new covenant in which God's law is put in our minds and written upon our hearts. And this is the meaning of the parable of old wineskins and new wine. You'll remember that during the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel told Mary that her aged and supposedly barren relative Elizabeth is already six months with child. And Mary quickly departs to visit Elizabeth in some unnamed village in the Judean hill country. Back then you didn't call or phone or text to plan a visit, you just went. Our passage tells us that Mary set out with haste and, and one wonders if it was to hide or become accustomed to her unwed pregnancy so she wouldn't have to endure any shame in her home village. Maybe this visitation was because Gabriel had mentioned Elizabeth's similarly miraculous pregnancy and this was to be a type of confirmation for Mary, though Mary had already accepted his words. Mostly, I think it may have been because Mary would find encouragement in Elizabeth's home, where she remained for three months. In any case, these two women are now drawn by a common, joyful experience, pregnancy, an apt theme of Advent. We joyfully await a baby who will change the world and give us lasting hope, peace, and joy, and love. Mary's words depict God's joyful vision for the world. God's vision is an inversion of the usual order. The richest and the most powerful do not come out on top. Those who have, those whose lives are filled with plenty are called to change, to open their lives to God and to others, because God will scatter the proud, the poor, and disenfranchised now will have cause for joy. Those who do not think they are good enough or righteous enough will be raised up, in God's joyful kingdom, they will become the leaders, the powerful. It is the rich who will follow. These words are indeed a magnification, a magnification of light. Our psalm and gospel reading today are ones of joyful praise. God's light shines on everything, illuminating the dark corners and dirty vestibules of our world and exposing the pain and injustices that still exist. We have hope for change, changes we can make within ourselves and a certain future to hope for where pain and sadness will be no more. Therefore, have joy, my friends. The light of Christmas is coming. It's, it's coming. It's bright and magnified. God came into the world to turn the world upside down or maybe right side up. God did start it by choosing a great religious leader or a political powerhouse or even a preacher. God chose a girl, a poor underage girl from a third world country with dark skin and dark eyes whose marital status seemed to teeter on the edge of acceptable society. But through her, God chose to shine the light on the whole world. Our response is to have deep and abiding joy and a contentment in our faith to reflect that light and magnify it further. I'll end with this. At a conference at a Presbyterian church in Omaha, people were given helium balloons, filled, um, all filled with helium, and told to release them at some point in the service when they felt like expressing the joy in their hearts. And since they were mainline Protestants like us, they weren't free to say, Hallelujah, or praise the Lord. If I were texting here, I would interject LOL. All through the service, balloons ascended, but when it was over, one third of the balloons were unreleased. Here's your challenge today. Don't be a part of that one third. Let your balloons go up with joy. The harvest of all joy awaits. Amen. Let us join our hearts together in this moment of prayer. God of all, we ask to rekindle our joy. You're the only one who can. Help us to be willing to follow you with all we have 
as we read the scriptures that reminds us who you are and the, the ways you love us. Ignite in us a sense of joy that overflows out of our hearts. Let this holy joy be contagious and spill over onto the lives of those around us. May your peace that surpasses all understanding be upon us, especially as we're wrapping up a year that has felt very scary and uncertain with its disasters, its wars, its rumors of war and discontent. Encourage our hearts with the knowledge that with you, we can live in your perfect peace, no matter our circumstances. We thank you for the joy and the peace you give. In particular, we hold up to you all who lead nations. Give them hearts for people's well-being. Invert egos. May they be on the sideline as we do the important work you called us to. We hold up to you all of those situations in our own lives that burden us. You know what they are before we even utter them. Strengthen our faith. Help us have a deep and abiding joy that sustains us until you come and make all things new. We pray all of these things in the name of the one who taught disciples. And so we're bold to pray the same by saying our father who is in heaven. Holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the benediction. My benediction today is actually the lectionary epistle reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 24. Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil, and may the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Amen. <laughs>